So now let's think about measuring what our total gains from trade are and seeing if we can do better. So we're going to think about a set of different potential buyers and sellers. And each buyer, as with the example earlier, is willing to potentially buy one unit if the price is lower than their willingness to pay. And each seller is willing to sell one unit if the price is higher than their seller costs. So again, people only go through with the transaction if they can get a benefit from it. And if you sort of think about all this, what you'll see that is that uh, a low price will tend to create a shortage because, of course, only a few sellers would be willing to profit, but lots of people would want to buy. And a high price is going to tend to create a surplus because only a few people are willing to pay a high price, but lots of sellers can make a profit at a high price. A price of 42 is actually going to give us our equilibrium here, so that's going to make buyers, Cody, Dwayne, and Apple willing to buy, and we're going to have three suppliers as well. So $42 again is our equilibrium price. And I want to head, go ahead and ask you guys to consider the following questions. So you may want to stop the video and try to work them through on your own. And then in the next slide, I'm going to go through the answers. So if we go and look at those questions, for the first question, what happens at a price of $27? All five of our buyers are willing to buy. We only have two willing sellers, so we would have a shortage. And then what happens with consumer and producer surplus at a price of $42? Well, here's our willing buyers. We calculate their consumer surplus as their willingness to pay minus what they did pay. And then we add up all their consumer surplus to get $54 of consumer surplus. For sellers, we remember that we take the price and then subtract the seller cost. It's common for people to switch those around. And we go ahead and figure out their producer surplus from the transaction, add them all up and get $51 of producer surplus. And then overall gains from trade are just 54 plus 51. So let's go ahead and see if we can do better. Can see if we can do better than that $105 of total gains from trade. Let's in particular think about the idea of maximizing the total amount of transactions. Because often when people think about efficiency, they think, well, if we have more economic activity, that's more economic pie, and therefore that's more efficient. So we want to go ahead and think about this. And in particular, let's go ahead and think about trying to make it so that every transaction is mutually beneficial and mutually consenting. So what I'm going to do to make that work is I'm going to have a sort of matchmaking process here. And I'm going to match Apple up with Vanessa because there will be a price between $70 and $55 that will be mutually beneficial. And I'm going to match Dwayne up with Wendy because there will be a price between $60 and $45 that will be mutually beneficial, and so on and so forth. So I'm sort of crossing over to find my matches here. If we go ahead and do that, we can think about what consumer surplus is going to be with this scenario here, what producer surplus is going to be, and what the total gains from trade are. And again, you may want to pause the video and try to work this out on your own. Notice the prices here are going to be as follows. So the first step, of course, is just to figure out all the prices that are halfway in between. And you can see those listed here. As far as actually calculating the consumer and producer surplus here, it would go something like this. So Allison is paired with Zeke. They're transacting at $22.50. That gives Allison $7.50 of consumer surplus. Zeke is selling for $22.50. He has cost of $15, so he gets $7.50 of producer surplus, and so on and so forth to fill in everything in this grid. If we total up all the consumer surplus, we get $37.50. If we total up all the producer surplus, $37.50, add that together, and we get total gains from trade of $75. And again, remember gains from trade in the market equilibrium were $105.
So we're going to have lower gains from trade in this situation. Now, it might still be possible for this to be efficient. So remember back to our Robinson Crusoe and Friday example that sometimes a situation with lower overall gains can be efficient due to issues of essentially distribution. So let's think about whether or not this situation here is efficient. And the answer essentially is going to be no. And to see why, imagine that people aren't obliged to stay with their trading partners. And suppose in particular, person Z, Zeke, is going to go ahead and sell to person E, Apple, for a price of 4250 And they're going to go ahead and pay severance payments or compensation to the people that they were going to trade with. If we do this, and we work it all out, we'll see that A is going to get $10 of benefits instead of $750 of consumer surplus in the last slide. V is going to get $10 of benefits, and E and Z are going to get $1,750 each instead of the $750 that they got before. So clearly, we made every one of these people better off than they were in our, in our matchmaking, our forced matchmaking equilibrium. Actually, is it an equilibrium? It isn't. And what we're going to see here is that any situation where we have a violation of what we call the law of one price is probably not going to be an equilibrium. So the law of one price is the idea that a good must sell for the same price in all transactions. Because if it's not, then whichever seller is only getting a low price is going to attempt to find someone else who's willing to pay a higher price. And if there are high, if there are people paying higher prices, of course, the buyers are going to shop around and try to find someone who's offering a lower price. So whenever we have a violation of the law of one price, we're not in equilibrium. This is all a little bit simplified now, and we'll get to more complex cases later. Another example would be, suppose we have neighboring countries or neighboring states. If the price of oil is really high in one country or state and really low in another, of course, people are going to buy low and sell high to try to make what's called an arbitrage profit by buying low and selling high. And as they buy things up in the market where things are cheap, they're going to drive up prices in that market. And as they sell into the market where prices are high, they're going to expand supply and bring prices back down. So there's going to, be ten, there's going to tend to be forces that are going to bring about this equalization of prices. Once we do have that equalization of prices, then we're going to be in an equilibrium. Notice we're ignoring things like transport costs and search costs and all that kind of stuff in this example. So it doesn't always hold exactly, but it's always something to keep in mind. Re remembering why the market equilibrium is going to maximize the gains from trade, one way of looking at it is to look at the supply and demand diagram. And notice that all the transactions to the left of Q1, the demand curve is above the supply curve. So all these transactions have willingness to pay greater than seller costs. So these first transactions are really big gains creating trades, and the later transactions less and less, but still they're creating gains. The transaction that occurs right where these two intersect has the height of the demand curve equal to the height of the supply curve. So it has willingness to pay equals seller cost. So that's exactly a break-even trade, neither loss nor gain. Beyond this point, we have the supply curve higher than the demand curve. So seller costs are higher than willingness to pay. So while these trades to the left of the demand curve are creating value, are creating gains from trade, these transactions to the right of the intersection are going to go ahead and destroy value because we're paying a lot or incurring a lot of re resource usage to create something that someone doesn't value that much, not as much as the resources that were used to create it. So it's not going to be true that a higher level of economic activity, a bigger number of transactions, is going to actually be more efficient because some transactions just shouldn't happen. 